Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Millionaire Real Estate Agent Podcast. I'm Jason Abrams, and this is the place where we lift the curtain on the world of real estate like never before. Every week, I sit down with visionaries, pirates, and mavericks. We're here to document, demonstrate, and most importantly, demystify their game-changing models and systems. What secrets propel them to the top, and how are they living their dreams? This is about passion, it's about strategy, but above all, it's about real, tangible success. So buckle up and let's dive in. This is the Millionaire Real Estate Agent Podcast. Consistency over time. If you had to ask me what's the one thing about Kristen Cole and the Kristen Cole Network that now spans across the entire United States, founded in a little tiny town named Wasilla in Alaska, I would tell you it's consistency. No matter what the market is, Kristen Cole has found a way to grow during it. And by the way, it's not by accident. Join me as we sit down and listen to the lessons of her life and the models that she used. Friends, buckle up. You're about to listen to Kristen Cole. Today, I'm joined with Kristen Cole. Kristen, how are you? I'm really good. I'm here in Scottsdale, Arizona today. Thank you so much for doing this with us. Really appreciate it. Yeah, honor. My honor. So you have a business empire, and I'm just going to call it that, that encapsulates like 1,500 plus real estate agents. And how many different states? Ballpark? 42, 45, depending on the day. Yeah. So literally the definition of scale. And I want to talk about what models you use or what you think the most important model is in order to to make all that happen. But before I do that, take me on the journey, because there's very few people that wake up and are born that say, I want to be a realtor. That may have been you, by the way. I don't know. But if it wasn't, can you tell us how we got here? Well, actually, I went to college and double majored in real estate and finance. Uh, So, yes, I did want to become a realtor. Um, And I got out of college in in 1984 and immediately, you know, back then you had to uh, fill out a form in a number two pencil, send it to Chicago and wait six weeks for your results. So, yes, June 18th of 1984, I became a realtor. Wow. Now, which college did you go to? The University of Arizona, Bear Down, Arizona. So let me ask you this. Gary Keller also has a degree in real estate from Baylor. And one of my favorite questions is, was the degree that you got anything like the life that you've lived? No. So, (laughs) okay, tell us more. You know, whether it's finance or whether it was real estate, you know, they taught you how to pass the real estate exam. That's still not very helpful because everything you learn in real estate school has nothing to do with selling real estate. They didn't teach you the people aspect of real estate whatsoever. So I learned a lot of facts, figures, numbers. This is how naive I was. I went to a class. I, you know, had been licensed maybe six weeks and they were talking about your farm and how to grow your farm. And I literally thought, why are we talking about like carrots and peas? Like I thought they meant a farm farm. I'm like, I'm in Alaska. (laughs) So I'm thinking, what the heck? So that's how how much the real estate degree did not prepare me for real estate. I had no idea what they were talking about. It's so good, but somehow you, you find a path. So when, when you get into real estate, you go through the process, take me back. It's now June 18th of 84 mm-hmm. fashion. I'm sure it was big hair and puffy sleeves. Yes. Big, big blonde hair. Yeah. It's perfect. How did you get customers? You know, it's interesting. I find it's easier to create a database in a small town than it is a big town. Um, Word of mouth travels very quickly. And so I didn't have to spend a lot of money. But what I did wasn't very sophisticated. And at that time, there were no CRM. So I literally had a recipe box and I just uh, started calling people. I actually legitimately thought to myself, okay, where if I could sell, where do I want to sell? So I chose like a, an area that was closer to my house, higher average sales price. Remember, the average sales price was 89000 okay? I sold my first house, 89 grand. Uh, interest rates were 12 and a half, 13%. So I just created a little farm. And back then, if you wanted to send something to the farm, you went to the borough 
and you got a set of labels and you took it back to your office and you put labels on blank postcards that you had pre-printed. So, uh, it, you know, back then I, I didn't know a lot about actually selling real estate. So what I did is I, what I did selling cookies as a Girl Scout, you know, I just started going, I would go door to door in the neighborhoods that I wanted to list houses in. I would send them information. I would tell them I was the expert. So when they called back, they say, I hear you're the best. And I'm thinking they only know that because I told them that. So I learned, yeah. I learned very quickly that you could become top of mind because nobody else was doing it. D- did you realize that when you decided to go down this road, that the day you get a real estate license, you are now an entrepreneur and that you were actually a business person and a CEO? Or did you think at that time, I'm a sales agent? I didn't think of me as a sales agent. What I, my thought, and I know every real estate agent thinks this way, I just want to get out of college and earn hundred thousand dollars. If I can do that, like I'm going to, I'm going to win. That's, that's going to be a win. And so I literally spent any extra money in that first three years, pouring it back into what now we would call our database, data bank. And then uh, it's, it's funny about year two and a half or three people started calling me versus me going after them. And then you just keep telling your story over and over and you you create mindshare. I did not really understand what I was doing. I just knew it was working and I just kept doing more of that. That was it. I didn't go to a lot of parties. I didn't go to the Chamber of Commerce mixers. I didn't do that. I just made it my mission to become well-known as the realtor that people should be talking to in, in Wasilla. Um, same thing with getting my commercial designation. I, I did the same thing. I wanted them to know that if you're going to buy or sell anything commercially, I'm your person. And so a lot of that was just messaging. And at the time, if nobody else is doing it, it's pretty powerful. Uh, first of all, I got to ask, did you make a hundred grand that first year? No, I did not. But I made a hundred grand my second year. Okay. You have to remember, this is 1984, Jason. I, it's a ton of money. I get, no, no, no. It's a ton of money. I don't even know. I'm sure in the comment section, one of our fans is going to put what the, today's equivalent is of a hundred grand in 1984. Looking back now over that three-year period, w- what was the lesson? Like if you could go back now and talk to Kristen mm-hmm. in 1984 w- to prepare her for those three years, what do you tell her? That consistency over time that your hard work is going to show up. It, it just will. And, and you don't have to know it's true. You just have to have seen it done in someone else, whether it's the four minute mile, it doesn't matter anyone else. I just followed people who had done what I wanted to do. They just hadn't done it in real estate yet. So I knew that if I consistently did something over time that I was going to win, I don't know why I knew that, but just looking, I, I love sports and just watching other athletes and watching their trajectory. No one gets there without a coach. No one gets there by not working out every day or two or three times a day. So why would we think we can succeed in real estate if we're unwilling to practice what we want to be our profession? So we're unwilling to get up and do scripts or conversation practice. And yet every athlete that wants to win does it at least twice a day. So it just made sense to me from an athletic perspective. And so I just thought, well, it's not it it you know if you want to get in shape and you go to the gym you don't look at your body the next week and think this is awesome. So why would I expect Well I do. Right by the <laughs> way I every I do and that's when I stop working out. But yeah, it takes more than a week. You look really good in those gray vests by the way. I thank you. You're welcome. So why should I expect my business to explode on week 1 or week 4 or week 12? So I just paralleled it to if I to real estate, to sports. And that is you have to do it consistently over time and just keep your head down and do all the right things. And people will start to notice you. And then when you have success, shout it from the rooftops, you know, let people know the success that you're having. And then people tend to want to do business with people they know, like, and trust. And so that was my messaging, even though I didn't know what I was doing, I was just patterning it after other successful people. Like Gary says, don't go chasing a shiny object go chase someone who's proven it and follow what they did. I just did it looking at sports because I, you know, back then no one had a team that was heresy. You know, you didn't even have an assistant. So as a solo practitioner, I just looked at other uh, where people were winning in other genres and, and did what they did. Just did it for real estate. She is so right. 
when she talks about this idea of be careful on who you're modeling your life after and modeling your business after. Gary used to say, Jason, you have to be careful in life to pick your profits. And I don't mean money. I mean the people that you're going to listen to. So if you go back and listen to Gary Keller's episode, he talks about, look, I follow Warren Buffett when it comes to my model for making money. And anybody else isn't who I'm going to follow because he made the most of it. And this resonates with me. You see, when you look up and you watch somebody having some sort of success, the first question you have to ask yourself is, is the success they're having solely because of how they show up and who they are, or is it because of the model that they're running? Now, if it's about them and the talent that they have, it might not be duplicatable for you. I always say that about inheritance. Inheritance is not a duplicatable model that I can teach. So don't watch someone who got all their money as a gift and then tell me you're going to be just like them. You won't. So if it's a model, now we move on to step two. Has anybody else been able to take that model and duplicate the success? And if the answer there is yes, then you can move on to step three. Has a bunch of people done it? And as soon as you can say yes to step three, now, now you have something that you can put into work in your life. You see, if you walk around following people that are having unique success, the problem is it's not a guarantee that you'll be any closer to what you want. You got to follow people who are running best practices and having scalable success. Those are the models that you want to follow. So as this is happening, we're all living our business lives and we're living our personal lives. So now you're three years in. What's going on with Kristen, the person, three years in? Had you bought a house yet? Are you? What are you doing? Yeah, so I'm married. I have three children. I've bought a house. Wait a second. Wait a minute. By the third year in real estate, you're married, in, bought a house, and you had three kids? Yes, and I became a pilot. Oh my gosh, that is a heck of a year. But now, now though, I want to ask. And I bought my first franchise. I bought my first Remax franchise and became the youngest broker in the state of Alaska. That's a heck of a year. By the way, that that in and of itself would be a heck of a career. So think back. I want to go all the way back. How did you do that with three kids? Because I get emails and phone calls from so many of our listeners that are struggling because they're, they're in the real estate business or they're even in another business, but they're trying to, to raise this family. They're afraid of trading these moments for money. And this is a big thing. Jason, I never missed one of my kids' events ever. So not knowing the term time blocking, I just thought, well, if I'm going to be at a soccer game from three to five, that means I'm going to make it up tonight from eight to 10. Or I would just make it up during different times, but I never missed anything. The one thing I gave up and it was a complete choice was not to have a massive social life. My job was super important to me. My family was super important to me. Going to church was important to me. And I knew something had to give, and I'm not a highly social person anyway, so I just chose to not have a massive social life. And and so that was part of it. But I can tell you, and I, I know this isn't for everyone, and please don't judge, but I went back to work after my first daughter was born six days later. Gosh. So I just took her with me and I took her with me everywhere. And back then, nobody really thought it was a big deal. You know, they really didn't. So I took my kids with me and they had things in the car to color and, you know, do whatever. So I just made it work. I really didn't think there was another choice. That story, it reminds me, you know, Diana Kokoska used to tell the story of putting her kids in this red wagon and then going door to door and that was that's just what they did. She she had to work. She just brought them along. And they would put labels on my postcards in the car, you know, when they got older. So, you know, they, there was a lot for them to do while I was showing a house or, you know, and I would tell them, hey, when I sell this house, guess what that means to you? And so then I would get them bought in on sending out the just sold postcard. I want mom to have another house to sell. So it was very much my kids worked a lot in the business when they were young. I think that most small business owners are actually running family businesses, even if their family doesn't work in the business. And if you're a small business owner out there, I want you to think about that. Do your kids know when you're having a great time and a rough time? Are there remnants of your business all over your house? I can tell you this. My kid just knocked over my open house signs into my Mercedes and I have a giant scratch, Kristen. So we're in a family business because now we're both paying to fix that door. He's 10. And that, what a growth opportunity for me. It always is. 
It always is. All right, so you're three years in. Time's moving as time does, and everything is clicking. You buy the franchise. What happens next? So uh, we go into a massive recession uh, in 1986. Um, we don't get to the bottom of it until May 19th of 1989. You can always see the bottom looking back. I, w- wait, I want to stop you. I want to ask you a question about that because we're in a shifting market right now. Right. And, and markets are always shifting. But were you angry? Meaning like you had been through three years, you bought this franchise, you wanted the economy to be strong, and now all of a sudden you get into a recession. Do you look up and stomp your feet and say, gosh, this sucks. I'm mad about it. I don't know. I just have never thought like that. I've always been the type of person that's when everybody else says it's a problem, I look at it completely different. Like, okay, nobody likes this, but there's going to be an opportunity. I just have to pay attention enough to see what it's going to be. And Again, I don't know that it was super conscious thought more than it was, I, you know, I, I had to learn to survive super young. So I was always looking for how was I going to do it? And back then everybody was turning in keys at the bank. And, you know, we went from oil being a hundred dollars a barrel to less than 10. So I had sold a house the year before a three bedroom, two bath, double car garage for 250,000. I sold that same house a couple years later for Fannie Mae for 25 grand. That's how bad it was. Yeah. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. So think of oh that walking gosh. commission, right? And, and this is in Wasilla, Alaska. So this right. is highly sensitive to the price of oil at the time. Highly sensitive. Yeah. So you did that thing, by the way, that great leaders do, which is you say, we went into a recession in 86. We came out of it in 89. Yada, yada, yada. We're here now. But I'm going to force you to stay in the recession with me for a minute. What was the one thing, looking back on that recession, that you draw on today when markets change? Is that people are always looking for an answer to a big problem. So the big problem was these banks were getting back all these houses, and they had never been in a recession before. They didn't know what to do. And so I literally would go in and pitch to the board of directors of these banks, especially the small ones like Home Federal Savings and Loan was one of them, United Bank of Alaska that literally shut their doors. And I would pitch to them why they should look to me to evaluate all their properties that they were getting back and to sell them. And not everybody hired me, but First National Bank of Alaska did hire me. They are the longest standing bank in Alaska today. I have a 38-year relationship with the senior vice president. Um, We're selling properties for them at this moment out of their trust department. So that relationship that we forged back then, anytime they need real estate services, they come to me. And it also, there was another savings alone. And I went before their board of directors. I remember I was so young, so nervous. Here I am in a suit and pumps and nylons and big hair. And I made a presentation to them as to why they should choose me. And it wasn't so much that I was selling my skill level, although I did tell them, you know, what I had a degree in, but at the same time, what I was selling to them is what we would call today being obsessed with solving their problem for them. And that I was going to be the person that could get the job done, that it didn't matter how long it took or how long the recession lasted, that I was in it till the end. I want to remind everybody, and this actually came up, if you go back and listen to the Phil Jones episode, remember he wrote the book, Exactly What to Say. If you haven't heard that one, go listen. But I asked him, I said, Phil, tell me about sales. And around the way, here's what he kind of said. He said, there's only two ways to sell something. And Gary Keller also mentions this when you ask him. He'll say, number one, solve a problem. Number two, present an opportunity. Those are the only ways to sell things at scale. And so when you look up, there's only a few types of problems in the world. There's puddle problems, there's well problems, and there's ocean problems. A puddle problem is a relatively shallow problem that a few people have. By the way, if you solve it, you're going to help a few people and you're going to make some money. Then you have well problems, which is there's a larger group of people that have it, but the problem is wildly deep and it's very complex. You can think of software companies that build intricate things for other software companies. They're solving a well problem. It's a limited market segment, but it's a deep problem. Then you have ocean problems. And ocean problems mean there's a ton of people that have it, and it goes all the way from the deep to the shallow. And those are the ones where you can absolutely make the most money. Remember, you're solving a problem 
or you're presenting an opportunity. That's how you sell something. Most of us, and, and, and this podcast appeals to a broad variety of entrepreneurs, but the, the majority of us start as salespeople in whatever our industries are. And then there's this group that seem to take the step and, and become business people and operate these really large scale businesses. What's the difference between being a sales owner and being a business owner? Being a sales owner is really running a very highly centralized organization where you as the salesperson are in the middle of it and you show up every day. And if you don't, nothing happens. So you're really the one at the center of the spoke and you're really given direction all the time. So if you don't show up, literally everything stops. And I think, you know, once you can bridge the gap and become just not not self-employed, but actually become a business owner, you have to learn how to then move your organization to a decentralized organization. And that is, is not easy to do because you've already trained people for a long time to come to you with every question. And so now you have to untrain them and you have to go hire better people, more talented people who are going to own their job and now are coming to you with, hey, I think we should do this. This would be a good idea for the business. Here are my thoughts on this. So it, it's really a, a different a transition into owning a business such that whether you show up every day or not, the business continues, that takes a different skill set than a salesperson. It really does. Okay. So if I want to make that leap, then the first thing I need to do is top grade my people so that they own their job. What's the next thing I need to be thinking about? Looking at you, you know your future org chart, like where are you really headed? Because there needs to be a vision for the organization that is not your personality meaning the vision needs to be bigger than you as the person. And I always say this, it's more important to have clarity around the vision than certainty of the outcome. So where are you headed and why? Why is it important? Why should they care? Because that's not only how you're going to attract more talented people, but it's how you're going to have them stick and stay. Um, because they're really tied into a vision bigger than you and your personality and something they care about. It also becomes, interestingly enough, a repellent. So people who are not interested in that culture, that vision will move away from you. So it's kind of a natural attractor and a natural repellent at the same time, which I think is really awesome because people that say to me all the time, what if I hire the wrong person? If you have a clear vision of where you're going, people will be attracted to that vision or not. And so hiring somebody that's the wrong person is probably not going to happen. Okay. So I've top graded my folks. Mm -hmm. I've managed to come up with a vision. Mm -hmm. Is the next step finding a way to articulate it at scale? Yeah. So having two things, one, the org chart um, around that vision. Um, number two, you know, looking at the financial uh, pro forma around that vision. So who do I need? And then what is the what does the pro forma look like when we have those people and we're executing? And then sitting down and actually sharing that vision and that org chart and the pro forma with everyone so that they understand where you're going, who, who's taking us there, what the financial rewards are going to be. And at the end of the day, why does this matter at all? So Gary always says, if you have a great idea, you better come to me with an org chart. You better come to me with a pro forma and, and you better come to me with a vision of how you're going to make this happen. How are you going to sell this in a way that people will want to jump on board and be part of that vision. And he says, you better have it on one page too. Oh, by the way. So how do I then kind of make this live and breathe in people's day to day? Because if, if, if I didn't know better, and I'm just listening to this as a casual observer, hearing some of these ideas for the first time, I might say, this sounds really esoteric. Every business has an 80 page business plan. Every one of them has a pro forma. Yeah, sure. We want to build the biggest company that does blank. How do you actually manifest it and make it live and breathe? It's, it's first of all, changing people's mindset around siloing to their own specific job. And a lot of people, it, it takes constant reminders. We think we say at one time, everyone gets it. It takes probably five or six times just for them to become aware. Then once they become aware, they can actually start to change their habits around it. But really understanding the bigger vision in that you have to articulate a lot. So once a month, we have what we call a state of the company meeting, and all the leaders from all over come in for that meeting. And we always start out with, first of all, we're always reading a book. But the second thing is, 
looking at the organizational chart and the vision, and then looking at our GPSs and saying, does this match? And then the third piece is, is what people are saying about us match who we say we are? And if it's not, then we either need to change our our mission, visions, values, beliefs, and perspective, or we either need to change that or we need to change our behavior. So we're constantly evaluating uh, what we're actually doing and what people say we do um, against what we say we are. And we do that every single month. And then once a week, we're doing it very granularly. And that's how we're going to get there. You don't get there. uh, And I would say this, Jason, narrowing your focus that's the only things we're talking about. And we're talking about them every single month at a, at a global level. And then every week on Friday at a more granular level. And we just continue to talk about it and look at the results. You know, this idea that does your audio match your video and mm-hmm. being willing to look at it every month together. Number one, you have to be highly accountable, I think, to even be willing to have that discussion. But number two, Kristen, that's got to make for some awkward moments because you're you're wildly self-aware. And I know that's a quality that you look for in others. But if I carry myself a certain way and then you hold up a mirror, doesn't that lead to really funky moments? It does. There's 100% it does. So I usually start out the conversation by, I'm probably going to say some things today that you're not going to like me very much, but they need to be said. And we need to talk about them. Because sometimes what happens is the leaders are all here. Last Monday, 17 of them were right here in Scottsdale. But then throughout the week and month, I'll hear something that someone says, and I'll think, didn't we just talk about this? So what I learned is that just because we've talked about it and they're shaking their head yes, is sometimes they walk out of the room and they become silos again. And they forget the bigger vision. And so it is a constant communication. I would say this overly, overly communicate and also, you know, be willing to say the hard things. At the last SOC, I started the meeting by saying, I'm going to have to say some hard things today. And this is about how we're behaving, not our personality. So don't be offended. I'm not upset with you. I'm upset that I haven't communicated clearly enough that has become part of who you are yet. And so we're going to continue to work on that. Because once people really get the vision and they really do understand it, that's no longer a problem. But you're really changing thinking. Most people do not think critically. So what they default to is this is the way we've always done it. And those are like the phrase that I hate the most on the planet. So they're not going to learn to st- to think strategically until you a- learn to ask better questions. Because if you just tell, 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 they will never learn it. So I ask them a lot of questions that are uncomfortable. What what is it that Gary always says? Telling is not teaching. No. Um, So I end up asking a lot of questions that make people very uncomfortable. And if they deflect, defend, I stay on it like a dog on a bone. I will not get off of it if you try to deflect or defend. And we really, I just keep asking the, the question, if that comes up, what problem were you really trying to solve here? And they'll say something. I'll say, no, 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 that's a symptom. What really is the problem? And a lot of times it, it will take me asking that and looking right at them in a very uncomfortable moment for everybody to finally go, the problem is blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you're right. Now let's solve that. You mentioned Ryan Holiday, and, he, and as you know, he's a friend of our program here. And I was reading it earlier today. I was reading Discipline is Destiny. And what he says is, consistency is a superpower. Day-to-day willpower is an incredibly rare thing. Now, keep in mind, he's talking about Marcus Aurelius's view of the world. So Mm -hmm. all these many years later, you're kind of saying something similar, which is the consistency that we bring to talking about our vision, talking about our org chart, talking about does our audio match our video. That's sort of the secret to keeping all of these people in all these different states all on the same page. And also, really, we talk about it a lot. I wish there's a better way to say it, but talking about their mindset. They've never been taught to critically think. They've been taught to follow. And so you're constantly helping them understand, like, you know, for them, it's okay. I'd rather them make a mistake than just following what's always been done. What I explained to them is we're doing something that's never been done. You cannot achieve something that's never been done doing things the way they've always been done. Wow. Yes. 
Well, I say to him, I said, let's think about this. We're wanting to achieve something in expansion and in Arizona specifically that's never been done to the level that we want to achieve it. We want to be at 5,000 agents with 5 million in profit in five years. So that has never been done. So we cannot get there doing the things that we always have done. So if your first thought is, well, this is the way we've done it. That's how we're going to get there. I want you to erase that from your mind. And I want you to think, is is my idea about how we're going to get there scalable? Is it something that that will work with the people that we have right now? So you're going to have to ask yourself better questions because going somewhere we've never gone and succeeding at it we cannot get there doing what we've always done. So that's what I mean about, uh, I say siloing. It's really that helping them understand that when you scale, scaling is hard and scaling, the reason we've worked so hard to get where we are, Jason, before we really put this vision out there is you've got to build the foundation for it. So when they tell me they want to do something a certain way, my first question is, is that scalable at 5,000 agents? Because if it's not, we need to build the foundation that will get us there with 5,000 agents, not the, not the one that gets us there today. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to have to change. Shoot, we break things and change things all the time. But for the most part, we're always looking, we're asking ourselves the question, anytime we're changing a system or a model, is it scalable? Is it scalable? So you- you're a critical thinker. You, you've you used the term critical thinking now three or four times. Do you find that critical thinkers often sound critical? And if you have, how do you get permission and buy-in from all of these people to, to be you? Because I love you, but you're going to punch me right in the nose in the most loving way possible if you think it's going to help me live a bigger life. And I, that's a lot for some folks. It's a lot. And even with last week, when when we went over the, all this, I said, there may be some of you that don't want to go on the journey and you're not bad people. But if you don't want to go, tell me now. And whatever you do, don't distract the people who do want to go. So I'm pretty clear. Most people who know me know I'm extremely to the point. And if you directly report to me when when we go through the expectation conversation in the hiring process, I'm super clear about the fact that I'm not going to take the time to sugarcoat anything. I will try very hard to, to be kind, but I don't have the time to really um, say it in a way that I think you're going to be able to receive it. I really need to just be able to say it, and I need you to be okay with that. And if you're not, then we probably need to talk about it. What ends up happening is, and Gary said it at Megacamp, you know, you need to hire killers that are highly skilled that have integrity. Because if you just hire highly skilled and killers, they're going to kill you. So the the cool thing most of the time is that the people around me are killers. So they really don't want me to sugarcoat it. They really want me to like punch them in the nose and say, what are you thinking? And it makes all of us better. So the conversations in that room can get pretty heated. And I can go from zero to 100 in a nanosecond. And we all had the conversation up front many times. Sometimes we have to revisit it about this is how we're going to behave in this room and nothing's off limits. And I expect you to push back on me and push back on me hard because I'm not going to get it right if we're only u- utilizing my thinking. So in this room, push back on me hard. It's okay. And let's really get everything on the table as to why this won't happen. And then talk about, well, how can we make it happen based on what we know today and based on what other companies have done that have been in our position that just might not have been in real estate. Well, and that kind of pulls the thread through because we just kind of went all through the journey and kind of then talked about how now do you get all these people in alignment. The part of the story, though, that gets somewhat lost is that we're all living our professional lives and we're all Mm -hmm. living our personal lives. Mm -hmm. And if anyone thinks you're going to live a hockey stick drawing, which is it's all going to be wonderful and everything's going to be up and then I just got news for you that that's not real. That's a TV show called Dallas. It, that's not what it is. And so I want to talk a little bit, if you will, about faith and the way that you deal with adversity. You've had it as a mom. You've had it as a business owner. You've had it as a dear friend. You've lost people you love. You've almost lost kids to the terrible accidents. Like If anyone said to me, who's been through it all? I think they're coming up with new things just to let Kristen Cole go through. That's funny. So 
Talk to me about faith on the days when it's just so hard. How, how do you do it? You know, in Quantum Leap, and if, if you haven't taken Quantum Leap, you should take Quantum Leap because Gary talks about, you know, the inside versus the outside. And your outside is just merely a reflection of what you think on the inside. And so people think I'm crazy, but it's really how I think. Anytime something comes up that's challenging, controversial, a lot of adversity, as you know, I've had a lot of personal adversity. The first thing that goes in my mind is there's a reason that God is allowing me to go through this right now. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to go with it. And I'm and I've never, ever been one of those people that thought like, well, why did God allow this to happen to me? I've always thought he's, this is for my good. And um, I can tell you looking back on everything that, well, there's of course some things that I wish had never happened. But what I can tell you is that by being willing to allow me to see what God is seeing in it, what ends up happening is not only do, do do me, my family, my friends, my coworkers get through it, but we come out the other side with a level of empathy and with a level of compassion and ability to help others that we would not have had before. <laughs> but you've got to start with that thinking. You've got to know that you know that you know that there's going to be a benefit to all of this if you're be, if you're willing to go through it personally so that th- then you can go through it and help other people who are going to end up having similar issues that you've had. And what that does over time is it attracts people to you. Initially, you, you're you out there you know, grinding, trying to find people to come work with you, work on your team, work in your organization. But over time, people are attracted to people who can figure out the obstacle on the road and how to, how to create a path around it for everyone, not just themselves. So just as an example... Um, This year, as you know, I made a hire from a guy that um, sought me out from Australia, been in the business 20 years. He moved here in April. His family's moving here next month. Right now, I have another guy that's moving here from Canada. And they're moving here not because of Kristen Cole. They're moving here because they want to be part of this vision, of this momentum, of this culture, of doing something no one else has ever done that's, that's exciting to them. So you naturally attract other killers who have skills, um, who have integrity, because if they didn't have integrity, they would not want to be a part of what they've seen me participate in. Because I've had to make decisions that cost me money, but they were the right thing to do. Let me ask you this. You've alluded to this idea that it's never been done, and you're doing something that's never been done. And that's attractive to some folks. Why does the fact that it's never been done matter? You know, it's in 2008, I really studied this about myself. Why is it that I am so attracted to doing things that had never been done? And um, I journaled about it for a year because I was really, really trying to figure out my big why, because I looked up one day and I went, well, why did I agree to become chairman of the oil and gas committee or chairman of the Agricultural Revolving Loan Fund Board that couldn't figure out what to do with a creamery corporation that they got back through foreclosure and the legislature, it was a hot button and they wouldn't, they wouldn't pull the trigger because half the people would hate them and half would love them. Like I did all these things that had nothing to do with real estate. And I did them because everybody had like one of the problems with the agriculture revolving loan fund, they tried to solve for 20 years and hadn't solved it. And I solved it in six weeks and did the hard thing that nobody was willing to do and privatize that creamery corporation. It could have been done, but people were unwilling to take the hits to do the right thing. So once I kind of became, and and that was something that I loved achieving at a level and doing things that just people said couldn't be done. It's, it's in me. It's, I can look back, you know, I was 10 years old and, you know, wanted to achieve and wanted to honestly buy clothes for school. And I got on my horse and sold American greeting cards door to door at 10. I mean, that was like what I, and I thought that was a normal thing to do. So it, it on a horse. Yeah, on a horse. On a horse. Now, I get it. Just stop the tape. Just stop. Matter of fact, stop the entire show. This was the only time I've ever had anybody say to me, Jason, the secret to my sales success is that I was on a horse. Said no one ever. 
but here's what I learned from it. Kristen Cole, at 10 years old, was getting up on a horse and going door to door to sell stuff. Similar, by the way, Cody Gibson, you're going to be hearing his episode here coming up shortly. This is a guy that went door to door on a bicycle that he had to borrow money for in order to sell newspapers. And it's coming up time and time again. The more successful people I talk to, the more interesting it is that, number one, they all did things at a relatively young age that the rest of us weren't going to do. I wasn't going to get on a horse and sell anything. The closest thing I ever got to a horse was a Mustang, and even then it had to be an automatic. Don't make fun of the host. Then you got guys that are going door-to-door selling other stuff, and all this leads to the same place, which is they started solving problems for people early in their life. All they did was continue to solve problems as they went through life and then monetize those solutions. And I don't care whether you do it on a horse or you do it on a moped or you do it in a Maybach. This is how you make money. All right, last question, and then I'm going to invite you to the lightning round. But if you today could go back in time and you could meet with 24-year-old Kristen Cole when she's first starting out in the industry, what one piece of advice do you give her? When I was 24, um, I was the first broker in the state of Alaska at 24. I owned my own Remax franchise by then, and I geographically was really cut off from the lower 48. So everything I learned was through a book or a cassette tape. And if I could go back and tell her anything, then it was, it would be commit to going outside every 30 days and learning from people who've already done what you want to do in person, like go learn from them. Yes. I learned from the books. Yes. I learned from the cassette tapes. However, when I see the trajectory of my life, since I joined Keller Williams and really surrounded myself with, with bigger thinkers, that's where you see the hockey stick. The first 25 years, yes, I succeeded. It, it wasn't really that remarkable. I mean, in my, in my opinion, it was awesome. I had a great life, but not necessarily remarkable. The remarkable part came when I surrounded myself with people who challenged me, made me think differently, pushed me, taught me. And that was, you know, Gary Keller, Mark Willis, uh, Mary Tennant, Mo Anderson, John Maxwell, you know, just people who had done things that I wanted to do. So I would tell her, spend the money, do whatever you have to do, hire the babysitters, get out of your own bubble. Because I was kind of the biggest, you know, real estate agent in a very small town. And, you know, you, you need to be around other people who think differently. It's great advice. If you're the biggest fish, find a bigger pond. I love it. Kristen, genius. Okay, welcome to the lightning round. So here's how this goes. I am going to ask you questions in very short order. There's not that many of them. We want the first thing that comes to your head. Oh boy. Do you understand? Yes, I do. First thing that comes to my mind. Okay, ready. Kristen, what is your favorite food? Pizza. Oh, stop the lightning round. It's so good. I love deep dish, thin crust, New York style. What's the best pizza? I like thin crust with lots of cheese, um, pepperoni, pineapple, and jalapeno. Oh my gosh, yes. The you sweet, can manifest. spicy. And I just want to remind the audience, any pizza you eat by yourself, regardless of size, is a personal one. Perfect. Okay, Kristen, favorite color? Orange. Favorite sound? Right now, what sound do you love to hear? I love to hear wind instruments. Beautiful. By the way, stop the lightning round. So many of the interviews we're doing name the specific instruments that they've loved. The oboe. So good. Everyone knows the sound. I love that. Uh, Favorite movie? Shawshank Redemption. So good. You're the Andy Dufresne. It's uh, unbelievable. Is there a book? And I know that you're an avid reader and you can't name them all. What's the one book that you just keep next to you or you keep around that you would tell this audience to go read? The One Thing. There it is, by Gary Keller and Jay Patterson. Because that's the difference between wildly successful and wildly average is focus. Is there a podcast, uh, other than this one, of course, that you listen to on a regular basis? I have probably listened to Gary's Think Like a CEO podcast and every single episode in it, no less, I kid you not, than 10 times. Why? Every time I listen to it, I'm in a little different space and hear it a little differently. And if I'm if I'm thinking like I'm going to give a speech on something, I will scroll through and the topics and find the one that's on the topic I'm going to talk about. And I'll listen to what Gary has to say to remind myself, you know, because he thinks probably a little bigger than me. But it, it it's it, they're time tested truths. Look at the MREA. 
how long has it been in, in publication? And it's still as true today as it was when it was written. So to me, that's a podcast I, I definitely have listened to more than any other podcast, period. Fantastic. Kristen Cole, thank you for everything that you have done for the real estate industry and more importantly, everything that you will do. And thank you for being such a friend of this program. Thanks, Jason. It's my honor to be here. You know, it's been 15 years of my life that I've known Kristen Cole. She's been a mentor. She's been a coach. She at one point was a business partner. And I I think about the last hour that we spent together. And here's my takeaway. There was no set of obstacles that she wasn't willing to overcome in order to get the things that she wanted. We all know that that's the secret to life, being willing to do anything that it takes. You don't always have to do whatever it takes, but you have to be willing to. Wasilla, Alaska, where she lived, is a really small town. But you know what didn't happen? Kristen didn't end up with really small dreams just because she came from a really small place. She looked up and decided that the entire world was up for grabs and she was going to get hers. My first aha uh-huh from Kristen is that there is no dream that you can think that's too big for what you can accomplish. You really can have it all. Evidenced by my second aha, uh-huh, which is running a big business and having a big life was only second to running a big family and caring about the people that were closest to her. And whether you look at the success of all of her children or the success of all of her businesses, the universal thing is the way that she thinks about obstacles. You see, the rest of the world sees brick walls in front of them, and Kristen just sees places that need a window. She manages to figure out the opportunity, the obstacle, is simply something for her to work around to get the things that she wants. There's a recession, so she all of a sudden becomes an expert on the banks and how they need to sell their properties. She's got a horse. Why not go door to door and sell greeting cards? You have the single greatest real estate market the world's ever known for the last 15 years. So she opens up the largest brokerage houses in the state of Arizona. Friends, this is someone who sees the obstacle as the opportunity. That's what makes Kristen Cole so special. On a personal level, I will tell you this. Having known her for as long as I have, I have watched her have successes and I have watched her have tragedy in her life, the likes of which that would take most people completely off of their feet and out of the game. And if there's one person who learned how to do hard better, it's Kristen Cole. Friends, as you continue the rest of your day today, consider this. You are going to face obstacles. You are going to have tragedy. Those things are not up to you. What is up to you is how do you think about them? And then what actions do you take to turn them into the biggest positives that you possibly could have? Because that is the difference between winning and losing. Friends, that was Kristen Cole. And there it is. That wraps another episode. Friends, I don't know what you're taking out of this. I really don't. I'll tell you what I want you to be taking out of it, which is these are the people that are having tremendously big lives. And the reason it's happening is because they're setting up the models and systems to do just that. Gary Keller told me that leadership is teaching people how to think so that they do the things they need to do when they need to do them so that ultimately they get the things they want when they want to have them. And that's what I want for you. You're all leaders. But it begins with leading ourselves. If you're enjoying this podcast, I want you to click the subscribe button anywhere that you get your podcasts. We want to be the voice in your head every single week. And every week we're dropping new content. We also send out a newsletter at the conclusion of every show to make sure that you get the highest points and the models and systems that were discussed. So if you want to sign up, I need your name and your email address. Head over to the millionaireagentpodcast.com millionaireagentpodcast.com. Enter your name and your email address and every week that newsletter will be in your box. Friends, you just went on a journey. I hope that what happens between now and the next time we meet is absolutely wonderful for you. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next week. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. The views, thoughts, and opinions of the guest represent those of the guest and not KWRI and its affiliates and should not be construed as financial, economic, 
legal, tax, or other advice. This podcast is provided without any warranty or guarantee of its accuracy, completeness, timeliness, or results from using the information. 